It is time to start a very exciting day where we're going to be learning about three really excellent tools for doing data quality assessment on your OMOP CDM. And uh, the schedule for the day is very straightforward. We'll go through some very basic logistics. We're going to have a half hour at the very beginning where I'm going to actually go around and ask you about why you're here and uh, what kind of uses you have for these sorts of tools. And you don't have to say anything, but uh, the more participation that we get, the more uh, understanding that the presenters will have about how to adapt what they're saying to the needs that you have. So I would encourage you to be as forthcoming as you can. Um, they are three different tools. There's some overlap between them, and they're all kind of evolving. So at the very end of the day, after all three pr uh, tools have been presented and demonstrated, there'll be a discussion about how uh, they might be improved going forward, and you're going to be encouraged to participate in that as well. We're going to start off with an excellent presentation by Hania Razaghi about the conceptual framework. It was touched on briefly in the uh, discussions yesterday of the um, in that panel that I participated in and, and that uh, Claire did such an excellent job of starting to show the data quality dashboard in. Um, and so you'll get a deeper understanding of that if you, you aren't already very familiar with it. Um, and we're going to have breaks in between these presentation sections, a 15 minute breaks, so the exact timing of those isn't that important, but you should know that it's going to be, you know, a nice hour for lunch and uh, there's be food outside and bathrooms available. We, uh, can answer your questions about that. This won't be quite as hands-on if you were here last year. I don't think there many people were. We won't have uh, as much attempts to actually run the tools because doing that in a group this size is is very challenging and can when you're presenting all three tools as will be done here, it's um, it's complex to give that level. But people are going to describe how. You can install the tools, uh, where to go to do that, where you can go to find help for it, and then spend more time on what it's like to actually use them and how they can be used to solve important needs related to data quality. So be more use case driven. Um, and there are really, and I am Andrew Williams. I didn't, I did the same thing last year. I am Andrew Williams. I am from uh, Tufts Medical Center, and uh, I did not. Uh, develop any of these tools. I am really a, a, an appreciator of the, the great work that's been done by these, these groups to, to develop these things um, and try and contribute to conversations about them, but that's about it. They're, they're the work of the, the presenters and their, their colleagues. Um, and the people that are in the faculty, I think you've, you've seen who they are, but we'll introduce them briefly first. We're going to have uh, Hania Rizagi from CHOP, uh, and she's um, you know, I'm not going to give everybody's titles. I think they're 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 listed in the um, in the description of the course. We want to really kind of jump right in. Hania will be will be following this, but uh, let's let's kick things off with a description of why folks are here. By who? Let's see. Let's go row by row. Um, who in this row would like to describe why they're here and uh, what they hope to get out of the this tutorial? I think these are mostly presenters and faculty. Um, so Tom White, I'm uh, one of the few people from uh, the health plan here. Um, and we're you know, very happy with the data warehouse we built with our claims data. But as we think about expanding into the clinical information and uh, you know the kind of insights that we could get, uh, wanted to be able to start utilizing some of the tools and be able to uh, query and partner on some of the data that's out there. So I'm responsible for data governance, uh, data strategy, um, data quality for the company. And I'm trying to get a sense of um, what the fit is with these tools, both for as we look to map to um, OMOP, but also whether they might be applicable to some of the broader questions we've got. I'm Daniel Smith. I'm from Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, I am going to be a part of a team that's serving as a middleman between uh, the physicians and the data. So uh, either answering some of my own research questions or assisting them in answering their research questions based on OMOP data. And of course, data cleaning kind of an important piece of that. So that's it. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Mark Kader from a small company in Boston, I fear. We are doing a lot of uh, helping companies to perform conversion of data to OMOP format. So it's very important that the quality of the data is of high standard. And I've been involved uh, with the data quality uh, initial discussions there that we had uh, earlier this year. So I just want to see how it's progressed since then. Uh, hello, I'm Mike Gurley from um, Northwestern University, uh, our Applied Research Informatics Group. Um, we have the All of Us uh, research program, and so we have the OMOP CDM through that, and then we also have the eMERGE program, and then we've adapted it for some uh, cancer uh, research databases, um, and we basically get all kinds of pushback from our leadership to try to figure out whether the data in our OMOP is trustable, so that's why I really want to learn about this stuff. Hi, my name is Ruth Weed from IQVIA. Um, I was working with David Carnahan on the FDA BEST initiative and stood up the DQA program and developed standard queries and he started doing dashboards and forwarded it all on to you, Andrew. And we paused the dashboard development to focus on the automation, hoping what was gonna be presented here this year we could adopt. Great. And she's with me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Adam Black from Maine Medical Center, and we're working on getting our OMOP instances up. And I'm here so that I can answer the question, how can I trust this data when people ask me? Hi, I'm MJ. I'm pretty new to this stuff. I'm part of Endpoint Health as a um, startup company and I'm responsible for the ETL of trying to get um, uh, EHR data into OMOP form and really want to understand the different kinds of best practices for ensuring quality and what we receive from um, our partners is of quality data and how to map it properly. I'm Seth Schobel. I am from the Uniform Services University here in Bethesda. Um, I represent um, a center at USU uh, called the Surgical Critical Care Initiative, and we're trying to map our data, which is consortium data, from three separate clinical sites to the OMOP model. So I'm here to learn as much as I can about uh, the tools and capabilities. Thanks. Hey, good morning. I'm Christine from uh, Abidonet in Korea. We are responsible for the converting uh, institutions data into OMOP CDM, about 20 to 30 institutions. So we, have, we are uh, hardly thinking about uh, the consistent and high quality of data for the network analysis. So I'm here. Hi, um, my name is Chris Ryan. I'm a data scientist at a startup called TrialSpark. We're writing software to recruit for and run clinical trials. Um, fairly new to the, uh, the Odyssey community and I'm excited to learn about these tools and how we can contribute. Connor, you are covered. <laughs> What's being asked? No, you know this. All right. Uh, we were going through. <clears throat> we're going through, and uh, people are just, just describing why they're here, what they hope to learn, if they want to. Z would you like to say? Thank you. So uh, I, I think I need to confirm first that this is for data quality session, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because we are uh, actually. Uh, I, uh, first, I introduce myself. I'm Hao Yan from Somandio, China, and we are a big, uh, big data company, and we are doing um, the data management, data convert for the hospitals, for psychiatry hospitals, uh, and uh, especially in China, the data, the source data quality is very poor, as it maybe some of you already knew, and how to improve the data quality, and in the in China, the the. The source data in each hospital, they use each, uh, they use different system. So 
uh, it's very, very challenging for us to convert the data to OMOP CDM. And uh, of course, the, uh, the quality of convert and the quality of uh, OMOP data uh, base uh, is uh, also, um, you know, to make to ensure the quality is also challenging for us. So I want to know how to uh, evaluate or how to make sure the uh, data quality. Another thing I want to know is that uh, uh, because of the policy of China government is becoming more and more open for data sharing and the data uh, management. So there are more and more uh, big data companies. They are working on uh, uh, working with different uh, model or different method. So I want to know, uh, because I, I believe OMOP is the best choice, but I want to know how to uh, convince other person we are the best because we use OMOB. Uh -huh. So that's the, yeah. Uh, my name is Evan Scholl. I'm the manager of research informatics at well, uh, research, research informatics services at Well Cornell Medicine. Um, we have an instance of the OMOB CDM, uh, just the databases, none of the tools. Um, really interested in learning uh, how I can answer people when they complain about the poor quality of our AOU submissions or our uh, our CDRN submissions. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks. That's just a quality group. Lima, do you want to say? No. Hello, my name is Jose Posada. I'm from Stanford University. I'm here because I want to implement the tools and see what we can find out. Perfect. Very nice to meet you. Put a face to a name, finally. Yes. Uh, our esteemed colleagues who've developed this uh, wonderful DQ, uh, DQueen tool have arrived. Do you want to say who you are and what you hope to get out of this? Hi. Uh, I was, uh, I'm in the Azure uh, University. Uh, nice to meet you. And uh, I hope to this tutorial help for your CDN. Yes, and for any of you who didn't have a chance uh, to see the demo of the DQueen tool, it's really a, a wonderful thing. Uh, deserved all of the praise that it got, and um, yeah, do do check that out if you ever get the chance. Uh, so let's see. Hi, I'm Kai Post from the Biomedical Informatics Department at UC San Diego, and uh, we use the Common Data Model for a lot of different projects, including all of us and uh, uh, Strongheart and such, but. I, as a programmer, am fairly new to the common data model, so I just came here to soak up as much as I possibly could about it. Hi, I'm Bina Kim from the Samsung Medical Center, South Korea, and I'm RN and also a tailor. Uh, my job is to maintain uh, CDM and develop CDM more uh, precisely. So I'm here to uh, learn how, uh, I'm here to learn the way how to improve our data quality. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody here wanna say anything? Um, I'm here with Chris from TrialSpark. Um, and our unique data quality challenge is that we have a network of community clinics, each with their own EHR, the own way of using the EHR. And we're particularly interested in seeing quality at the care site level. Uh, I'm not sure if any of the tools are adapted to that yet, but we would love to help contribute to any of those new features. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Louis Hendricks. I'm uh, with a company named Global Value Web. We do data across the value chain, lots of operations, development, and now also stepping into the research part. We do a lot of work for life sciences, and they, uh, I think dabbling into the research helps us to connect the information coming from the patients to bring it back to the patients. So I'm here to understand as much as possible for what we need to do to establish a small team to get going. Not surprisingly, we have a uh, back offices in India. We have an office that is really 100% oriented on, let's say, the pharma and the lab knowledge of things. And of course, we have a technology office. And um, we need to figure out how to let those people work together 
to get the maximum out of it. So when I hear already a lot of people talking about quality and data quality, I know from other data areas, you only get data quality if you have people there who also really truly understand the domain. Uh, so uh, we, 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 we're learning and we hope to find out a lot of things on how we can get those people properly started and multidisciplinary team. Oh, hi, my name is Johnny. I'm from Mount Sinai uh, Health System, and we're one of the data warehouse that feeding data for our um, Icon School of Medicine. I'm here. Um, I learned that our researchers and physicians spend 80% of their time trying to find the right data, clean up the data before they do the research. So I'm here try, uh, trying to learn as much as possible so I can answer the questions that the physicians asked me as uh, like I'm not from any like a medical background but I'm not, uh, I wanted to know more about how to improve our data quality without I mean the, our physicians knows a lot more details in the data than I do but yeah so in the in the, uh, very specific, specific domain so I wanted to know if it's possible for us to to improve data quality ahead before we're handing data to them and uh, there's anything else we can do. Okay. Thank you. Hey, my name is Lisa Malinger. I'm from North Shore University Health System and we are part of all of us and we are in the process of rolling out an OMOP instance. Um, our, my goal is to see how we can leverage the, the data quality tools here to monitor our data quality. So. Hi, I'm Neil Manius. I'm from uh, Geisinger Health uh, Systems. I'm with the research portion of that. Um, responsible for our research, the Identify Data Warehouse. Um, uh, we have a proof of concept of OMOP and uh, we're, I think, getting serious about it, so I'm here to to make it production quality. So I'm an Intel developer. So, thanks. Good morning. My name is Dave Barman. I work for Odysseus Data Services. I'm here to learn more about the different tools so I can better help our customers. It's, it was a late night. Hi, I'm uh, Siegfried Gold. I'm currently a student at University of Maryland, but I've been involved in the Odyssey community. I, I was at, I remember OMOP version two. Um, and uh, I've done a lot of work with Michael Kahn and I sometimes get invited to do things as if I'm a data quality expert. And so I figured uh, this would at least make me a little closer. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sergio Slava. I am a medical informatician working for Merck at the Center for Observation and Real World Evidence. We have uh, eight data sets in, in almost common data model format, which are a key component of our data analytics platform. And uh, the reason that I'm interested in this topic is because one of our top priorities is how to make our real world data research grade and regulatory grade and data quality is one of the key uh, elements in that. So uh, I'm very interested in, in learning uh, how to use these tools. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Well, that's a rich array of, of needs. There's a lot of people who are doing ETL conversions is people who need to answer questions from the researchers who are using a, a CDN that's already been built, people who are evaluating OMOP for some purpose for their company or, or a research institution, uh, people interested in seeing things across networks, perhaps uh, other functionality uh, requirements that weren't uh, specified, but that's a very, uh, very informative and helpful set of uh, descriptions and, and obviously a very talented and knowledgeable group. So this is exciting. Um, I think there's gonna be a very productive discussion at the end of the, of the day about what your thoughts are on um, how these tools can be moved forward. And hopefully there's enough time for each of the presenters to also give uh, some chance for questions and, and some back and forth. Uh, I think you'll each have a lot to offer uh, for the specific tools as well as for that more general conversation. 
and really that's the the main thing I wanted to cover in in the introduction. Um, I don't want to spend any more time. Sort of uh, go ahead, Siegfried. I'm just wondering before we see all three. I was wondering if before we see all three tools, if we could get a tiny orientation to any relationship they have to each other, or like just to are they three competing tools, or are they three tools that do different things? It's a very natural question. We don't have a, sort of a complete um, matrix of features that you know are supported by some but not others. It's a it's I think that kind of comparison is is, is a very natural question to ask. We don't really have that available, so I think um, that's uh, yeah we don't have that for you. But uh, I understand the the interest in it. Hania, I know we were scheduled to go on in about 10 minutes, but uh, you want to start early and we'll, we'll have maybe time to, to break a little early or, or more time for questions than we, we would otherwise? So actually it's going to take Hania maybe a minute or so to, to set up the, the computer since I sprang that on her, who's got a, a thought about, it's, it's along the lines of what you mentioned, the sort of the need for seeing things across a, uh, a whole network of related institutions. So more than one CDM at a time, just a show of hands. Well, who's, who's interested in that functionality or that would be important to them? So wow, it's a large, largest number of folks. Wonderful. How about um, seeing instances that are loaded over time for the same CDM where you're interested in that. Okay, great, perfect. How about the ability to track the resolution of issues that have been surfaced? So there's a, obviously you, you get indications about something, where is, yes, okay. So there's some there. Um, I think that's really important. Let's see, what are, what are other features people value very highly? They think, you know, if I could build, if, I, if there were no limit to what could be done with data quality, uh, what would a feature be that would actually meet those needs? Adam, love it. Being able to compare uh, benchmarks sort of your data quality against other institutions so you kind of have a sense of, of uh, where you fit in terms of a larger context. Great. Well, that's, that's very much the kind of network capability I was, I was thinking about. That's, that's great. Other thoughts on the kind of features that would be particularly useful? Would you say something? Sorry, it may fit into your number two, but um, anomaly detection in terms of data quality over time. So when you start seeing um, codes appearing that weren't there before or disappearing that were there before. Terrific. And so I think now Hania has set up and uh, um, Take it away, Hani. Hi, um, I'm Hani Rizagi. I um, am part of the PedsNet CDRN, um, and we have a pretty uh, extensive data quality program, and we are kind of serious about data quality just generally. Um, and so I work in the Data Coordinating Center, uh, and uh, you'll see more of our actual specific um, data quality program a little bit later today, and this is mostly just an overview of um, kind of the theoretical frameworks and what's been done in the field of data quality generally. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, so I wanted to start with this. I think people have a misconception that data quality is just like a thing that you do to data and you briefly mention, and once you clean it and get rid of missing values, everything is great and you don't need to think about data quality. And especially when we get into complex um, clinical data uh, using electronic health records and, and that sort of thing, we realize that it's something much deeper and um, it's, it's really become kind of like a science on its own in the past few years. And so uh, we want to make sure that we treat it as such. Um, and part of that is actually working with investigators to kind of set expectations of what um, it means to work with the, this, this complex data and um, that some of the issues that they find are just normal and they can't just be cleaned up magically. Um, so that's kind of you know the setup that that I uh, want to start with. So, data quality um, really has no consensus formal definition. Um, the most that 
I think the most widely adopted is just this, fit, this idea of fit for use. And so poor data quality leads to poor study if um, you know, we don't think about how to handle data quality systematically um, in, in our data. So this is just an example of one, an example that actually hit us in PedsNet. We were looking at a group of, uh, a cohort of patients with um, kidney disease. And we were looking at the patients who have had, who had been seen recently in a clinic and um, looking at the, the number who have been hospitalized over time. And you can see that this one site is a huge outlier and, um, you know, when we looked at that a little bit deeper, we realized it was because of how that site was classifying an inpatient visit versus what, how the other sites were. And so it looks artificially inflated, and that's not a real thing. So, um, you know, I wrote here that poor data quality can lead to spurious cohort selection and misclassification of major variables and misleading reporting of results. And you can see how, you know, through this example that that, that can happen. So data quality, you know, I th for many years, I want to say for almost a decade now, people have been trying to define how to measure, how to assign terms to data quality. Um, in 2000, I think this is 2012, Nicole Weiskopf, who um, works at the uh, in Oregon at OHSU, she came up with a, a framework that kind of uh, looks at the, the major terms used to describe data quality and the synonyms that were then used to kind of describe the same thing in the literature. And so there's this idea of completeness that something is, uh, you know, we have a, the full range of records for a concept. Um, correctness, that the, the, the concepts that we have actually measure uh, what we want. Concordance, that there's, that the variables across different tables actually measure you know, the same thing. Plausibility is uh, kind of seen as believability, trustworthiness, et cetera, and currency as um, timeliness, that the sequence of events makes sense. So that's, that was kind of how data quality, I think, um, started with people thinking of different terms. Um, there are different approaches to data quality as well. So some people are very interested in standardizing terminologies and thinking through how to uh, develop an ontology or some sort of framework to describe what data quality is so that when I use the same word, someone else, you know, that we have a standard sort of framework to think through what that means. And so this is a paper that was published in 2015 um, that attempted to kind of think through a standard ontology. And I, it's not been widely adopted but I think you know it's it's getting people to think through how to not just measure concepts but how to represent them. Um, there's also a lot of uh, right now um, these large networks like PCORnet, for example, uh, do a lot of network benchmarking, and so they have a data characterization package that they send out, and that you can uh, go and it's just characterizing how many patients are in the database, how many we're seeing in the past 18 months. Uh, does your header diagnosis agree with your visit type and, and that sort of thing? Um, and then there's some formal statistical tools and methods that people have created um, to, to kind of address data quality, um, you know, very analytically, you know, clustering by site on, on certain um, concepts to see how it differs between sites, um, like, like something like drug utilization or, or something like that. You just, basically looking, uh, using known statistical tools, not just for analytics, but to kind of evaluate data quality. So uh, I wanted to go over this landmark paper because I think a lot of people have um, heard of this, or if they've not heard of this, you will. It's uh, so uh, Michael Kahn at Colorado uh, and this, a large consensus group developed kind of what they call a harmonized framework for data quality. And this is to standardize the way that people think about how to describe data quality and how to uh, kind of attach metadata to their, their data quality checks. Um, 
so the, the major categories are conformance, completeness, and plausibility. Um, and the, the, this is, so uh, I'll go over a little bit more detail, but these are kind of like the, the categories that people will use to uh, describe each data quality check that they apply. Um, and this is done within two contexts, verification and validation. And so verification focuses on internal consistency um, and validation focuses on external consistency, and you'll see through some of the examples. So um, we'll start with conformance. So basically the value of conformance is, does, is, does your data, do your data and the, the data values adhere to specific standards and formats that are specified by the data model? Um, or whatever standard you're using. And so there's value conformance, relational conformance, and computational conformance. Value conformance, you know, are the values conforming to the, the spec specifications? So, um, you know, if your value set for sex is male, female, or unknown, that your data is conforming to that. Um, and then for, so that's in the verification, which is internal consistency. And then in the validation, um, it would be con comparing to some sort of external standard that you needed. Um, relational conformance deals with um, how, if you're using a relational database, um, the way that certain values link to each other and making sure that they are aligned. So for in the verification model, that the one patient MRN is consistently used for the same patient across um, tables. And then for the validation, you know, it would be if you were using if you're multi-networks um, that the values conform to the not, not, not null requirements for that exchange. And then computational conformance is if there's computations that are made um, within, and again, in the verification, which is the internal consistency, whether the um, BMIs that are computed from heights and weights are consistent. Um, you know, if, if a patient has a height and a weight, that you'll get the same BMI every time and that, that value is represented correctly. And then for in the validation um, context, that would be to compare those to the C, like an external standard like the CDC. The next category is completeness, and this is, are the data values all present in something? So um, you can see in, in the verification and the validation concept how that might be um, important. So an example in the validation concept, for example, validation context is uh, whether um, you know we see a drop in ICD-9 at the same time that we see kind of an uptick in ICD-10 when ICD-10 values were um, introduced. And finally, uh, plausibility. So in this, uh, the plausibility is, and I think this is, I think, a lot of what we think about when we think about data quality is, is this believable? Um, and so within plausibility, there's uniqueness, atemporal, and temporal plausibility. Um, and uniqueness deals with, um, you know, making sure that the values for a single object are, are not duplicated, for example. Um, but the atemporal and temporal plausibility are kind of deal more with, do these value kind of make sense? Are they plausible? Um, and so, uh, you know, for example, when temperature is taken, are they positive values? And then the, in, within the validation concept, you know, do, are they believable? Are the HbA1c values in a type 1 diabetic population kind of what we would expect for that cohort of patients? Um, and then the temporal plausibility is, is similar to the atemporal plausibility, except it has to do with time. So it's time dependent. Um, you know, in a sequence of events, does it make sense um, what you're seeing uh, in terms of the data? So these are, um, this is kind of used to categorize what checks are. So some examples of what the data quality checks uh, using the, the framework. Um, a temporal plausibility, uh, whether, so we once found that 48% of labs were outside of the normal range, and so this didn't seem plausible for us. And so this would be categorized, looking to see whether checks fall within a normal range is something that we would categorize as a temporal plausibility. Um, you know, temporal plausibility, if there's 
changes in the number of records from month to month um, in for a particular uh, patient. So, so you can see how using the, the terminology that was developed by Michael Kahn and his colleagues um, to kind of categorize how we think about checks helps people um, you know, develop checks and also help people to um, use a common framework and ontology, a, a way of communicating about these checks. So this is another paper I wanted to go over, even though not quite wi as widely adopted as um, Michael Kahn's framework. And this, this paper deals a lot with um, how to actually take some of these concepts and apply it to a study. And so what, um, what and this was, again, Nicole Weisskopf um, from OHSU. She looked at, um, in a study, you have patients, variables, and time um, are the kind of the three constructs that she thought of. And then um, for the you know data quality framework, she was thinking of complete, correct, and current. And again, you can use Michael Kahn's or, or another framework if um, if desired. But uh, what she did was develop actual standard methods to kind of think through how people who are doing different studies can have some sort of way of approaching data quality that would be standard. So, for example, the the correct patients, the distribution of values is plausible across patients. Um, so it would be it would be taking different concepts and, and applying it. And so this is more kind of an application, whereas Michael Kahn's uh, framework is more of a um, a harmonized terminology. And so it's it's uh, they work together, but they're kind of doing different things. So. Um, Okay, so another paper that was uh, that we wanted to kind of review um, in 2017, uh, Tiffany Callahan did a comparison of six networks to kind of com using Michael Kahn's uh, framework that he used that he developed, um, looking across these networks and seeing. Uh, manually actually going through and categorizing what these checks would be under this harmonized terminology and looking across the, um, the networks to see who's using what type of um, check. So these are the, the networks that she used uh, as part of her comparison. And so um, the networks by far are using plausi uh, atemporal plausibility um, in their checks. And you can see kind of just the distribution of, of the, the harmonized terminology there. Um, I thought this was also interesting in, in the just the different distributions of uh, what, you know, per network, what the, um, the distributions of the checks are. So you can see some use a lot of plausibility atemporal. And it was interesting, given that I'm in the PedsNet um, network, that we were kind of an outlier in, in, um, and that we use a lot of completeness checks. Um, and so this was in 2017. There have been some changes. But um, you can see how taking a framework, like the one developed by Khan, and applying it to these uh, actual checks and actual data quality uh, approaches um, you know, it, it's a, it provides a, a common way to communicate and think through data quality. Um, and so a couple of takeaways from that paper, uh, nearly 100% of the checks that were done were done in the verification context, not the validation context. Um, and this is probably because coming up with a validation context and external standard can sometimes be difficult. You know, what is the right distribution to compare your data to and how do you determine that? And, and, and so it, it becomes a little bit more tricky. So um, the validation context in the Michael Kahn framework is, uh, I think, uh, an area to be developed. Um, there are 11, over 11,000 checks across these networks. So there's a lot of different ways to think about data quality um, and how to apply checks and different things that you can look for in your data. And we're going to, I think, go through some of these you know, throughout the day. Um, and that organizations vary in their approaches to data quality, both in mature, uh, methodology as well as maturity. And I think that's a little bit of what Nicole Weisskopf was trying to do in her paper, was kind of think through um, you know, how to, to not just use standardized terminologies, but uh, thinking through 
standardization in application and um, comparison. And that's a field that's still kind of being developed. So that's all I have. Are there any questions about this or any thoughts? Yeah. So that's, I think, what we're going to do a lot to go. It's what, you know, the rest of the today will be. This is just kind of laying down the theoretical framework. But, um, you know, what, what you would do, what a lot of us have done um, in these networks is look through these, these, these terms um, that, for example, Michael Kahn has created and think about, you know, so I had the one slide that we have. So, um, Sometimes data quality checks come through just thinking a priori, what do you want to do? And some are just relation, you know, like our foreign key constraints, you know, uh, when we're developing a database, are they being applied and, and that sort of thing. And so those, those are obvious ones. And then there are the, the ones that come up when we are trying to do studies. Um, and for example, we recently came across one that uh, we had like no flu testing um, in a group of patients admitted for for croup in a group of, in a cohort of pediatric patients, and that seemed really off by the investigator. But that was what the data that was given to us across these institutions said. And so what we did then was develop um, a a data quality check, or we're in the process of developing a data quality check that would make sure that flu testing is appropriate, and we, that we see a spike in the winter months, and and um, and a decline in, in the summer months. And so that would be kind of an idea of a check that you would use using this framework and then putting it in a, a package that you then can apply and look for uh, systematically. And you can do that within a network or you can do that within like a study specific context. And so these are kind of the tools that you would use to do that. Is there indications which uh, type of tests are more important for the data quality? Is there ability to measure and say that Odyssey has, I know Odyssey in this paper was trashed in some ways there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and unfairly I would say, uh, but you know, is there a way to measure based on this information of which kind of the, has the a better ones? quality, yes. <laughs> yeah, there isn't actually. There isn't a good way right now to kind of do that comparison. And I think part of the reason for that is because this field is, is pretty new. And so, and part of it I think is because so much of it is fit for use. It's context specific. So what, you know, uh, flu testing might be important for us, for example, but for someone else, you know, who focuses more, if they're like a cancer clinic, it would be more important for in their use case um, to, to look at, you know, cancer diagnoses or uh, infections in cancer patients, or, you know, things like that that are a little bit different. So it's, it's a difficult thing. There's nothing, there's not, there's no sort of ranking of checks that I know of um, in the literature quite yet. Um, I think a lot of it is still kind of subjective and still in the process of, of being developed um, and thinking through what, what's needed for a specific use case. And Nicole has uh, an ambition, uh, Nicole Weisskopf has an ambition of being able to construct a rational system that allows you to really evaluate the impact, at least for certain categories of, of users and, and use cases. And there's a, there's a call, it's worth mentioning, so a lot of what's being presented is, is across networks, obviously, and there is an alliance of dedicated data quality folk who are interested mm -hmm. in, in developing ideas about how to pursue things. It's uh, called the Data Quality Collaboratory, and Nicole runs it with Meredith Zosis. She, they took over from Michael Kahn. Um, but it's been in existence for a few years. It's a forum in which people come with both ideas and, and whole platforms that are, that are doing things. And uh, it's in that context that some folks who are starting a new effort to uh, put up a community-based portal where data quality checks can be authored and represented um, and perhaps you know, run eventually across different kinds of CDMs. Uh, I was on the call last month, and uh, during the discussion of that, I suggested that if uh, we were to, if the authors of those checks said, well, this is the specific use that this was for, uh, 
you would begin to be able to see this is a, you know, I, I needed to do X, and in order to do X, I had to generate data check Y, right? And that begins, it doesn't answer that question about which ones are most valuable, but it does begin to tie checks to very specific uses in a way that I think eventually could lead to some rational yeah. prioritization scheme. But it's a very important issue. There's, as the, you know, the number of checks proliferate into the thousands, yeah. um, some scheme for prioritizing which ones matter most is, a, is an important thing. Is that all right if I extemporaneous? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. And I think, you know, as it's just, it's such a kind of a new field that a lot of this is still sort of in development, thinking through um, how to represent these and, and how to uh, take a specific use case and know what to, what kinds of checks to apply to them. So. Um, I've had a hard time getting my mind wrapped around these frameworks, but I um, maybe with Mark's question, um, it is seeming to me not that there's some checks that are more or classes of checks that are more important, but uh, when you go down the list from conformance to completeness to plausibility, and also when you go from left to right from verification to validation, that you have an increase in complexity. Yeah. So you can't really, if you can do validation, you should have been able to already do verification. And if you can do right. plausibility, you should have already been able to do completeness and, and uh, conformance. But I would guess that nobody wants to come out and say, you know, some one is more important because, you know, the, uh, the conformance ones are going to be fairly clear cut. Yeah. Whereas plausibility, like you're going to have some real uh, divergence of opinions. No, that's that's exactly right. And um, I think that's part of the reason why a lot of these networks are kind of still in their infancy, for example, in the validation context, because we don't yet have great ways to, to think about this. Um, and I agree that, especially as you go to plausibility, that's pretty wide and that can encompass so much. And so we, you know, at PeaseNet, we have a huge number of data quality checks, and yet when we send out data sets, we have investigators coming back to us angry and saying, "This doesn't make sense. Why is the data showing, you know, this, you know, th this thing, a specific thing like creatinine values don't make sense in my in my cohort of um, of of." patients with chronic kidney disease or whatever it is. And so um, that's actually led to, uh, at least you know, within our context, we um, are trying to develop what we're calling semantic data quality checks. And we're still thinking through what this looks like and uh, what this looks like. And um, we're thinking, and I'll go over a little bit when we talk about PEDSNET, but we're trying to apply and come up systematically we're still in the very infancy of the systematic part, but how to think about data quality within the context that you want and, and developing kind of like a standard checklist about what that would look like. Because no matter how many conformance checks you get, when a researcher gets their data and sees that their creatinine values um, are not what they would expect in a specific cohort of kids with chronic kidney disease. What do you do about that? You know, so it's it's a difficult question, and I agree. Um, there's a lot to be developed here still. I think there's a it may be worth emphasizing a couple of points too about what data quality frameworks are for. So there's a the data space and the kinds of errors is so large that you just need some way to kind of put put boundaries on that space and say these are these are the kinds of things there are, and I think. That not only helps you organize what the results are, but also helps to define what completeness means. If you really want to take a very systematic approach, they, if you've really covered that entire space in the, in the framework that you have, it allows you to start thinking about this is how complete we have. Completeness of checks, completeness of an assessment of data quality, right? So if you've defined the data quality space adequately with the way you've carved it up, then it gives you a, a, some traction that says this is a complete set of checks across the entire domain because we've defined the domain according to some you know, clear definitions. And um, it, 
beyond that, I also wanted to mention, I think the exact sort of ordered relationship between completeness and conformance relative to plausibility is, uh, has practical consequences. So in some networks, there'll be uh, a formal process where you're expected to have very complete and completely conformant data. And uh, that's sort of a first pass. And then when you have the appropriate scientific and knowledge uh, experts to understand plausibility, there's an additional round after that first thing. So I think um, that, you know, it isn't just that they are hierarchical in that way, but there's actual functional yeah. uh, consequences to the fact that they are hierarchical and, and the way that those data are used. I'm curious, Steve, so once you've identified that there are quality problems, um, how do you get them fixed? And the I think there's some insights that might come from this group that would help the various groups that are providing the data um, because every data provider has its own flavor of data governance and data quality remediation approaches. Um, I think part of your data quality checks will tie in, um, uh, the prioritization will tie in to say, well, given that we've got all these issues, which ones are going to provide the most value if we start doing it? But even getting into some of the logistics of who should own um, the, the quality improvement initiatives around certain data domains. Uh, where what are the best practices around that? What are the you know where can you fix it? How can you fix it? I think there could be some lessons that could be learned that could be shared across um, the community and shared back with your data providers so yeah. that there's more consistency in terms of how they're cleaning the upstream data. And I don't yeah. know if there's been work done already to try to characterize that and, and communicate that out. Yeah, I think a lot of that, at least in, in my experience, and you know, feel free to jump in, anyone, um, but we, um, it, it, prioritizing what needs to be done, and because y you can go back to your ETL data provider, like the ETL analysts that, uh, who are you know, actually doing the work and, and pulling the data and, and standardizing um, with hundreds of ways they can improve, and I think that gets tiresome after a while, and so um, I think some of it is the use case. Some of it might be developing really good metadata quality, like especially when it comes to um, kind of describing provenance and how the data are pulled. And I know Odyssey, uh, they they started, oh, what is the ETL, the, do you know, do you remember? Themis? When, I'm sorry. What, sorry? I'm, no. Themis, yes. It, I think it's Themis. They, they kind of have developed uh, standards in how uh, you should define, because part of data quality is, you know, for example, how do you define an outpatient visit? If you go to a health services researcher, they'll say, I don't care if they saw, you know, if, they, if a patient came in for a radiology visit, what I care about is if they actually saw a physician. And that's not necessarily a standard way to do things, you know, how, how these are defined um, by each institution. So I think even just coming up with those specifications helps hugely. Yeah. But other times they'll actually just store the height and the weight, but not the BMI. So we can compute the height and the weight, but you can't use the computed height and weight in HEDIS. Yeah. And so it becomes guidance back to the providers to yeah. say, please change your processes to make sure you're actually capturing what needs to be captured. Yeah. And work with your ETL folks to make sure that they're transmitting it correctly so that you're actually improving the quality up front. And again, I think that's also the place as you're doing your research that come up with some of those themes of high-impact ways to improve quality that might be really just hopefully minor processes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's where a lot of the provenance metadata standards and standardizing those processes helps hugely um, for your specific use case. Um, so uh, last years or so, we spent a lot of time on data integrity and uh, Alcoa and Alcoa Plus. So when you look in the value chain, so when you produce medicines, it's all strict, right? It's all fixed. And also there, the industry is still learning to do better on an everyday uh, basis, uh, so to speak. And then you push that into development, you push it into research. So nowadays, life sciences puts research labs in medical centers to do all kinds of research there. And then I'm looking at what's happening in those laboratories. And I say they are not that strict yet. 
<laughs> uh, and it all comes down to the data organization, the quality, and the same type of rules. Uh, so it seems to me that there is a, uh, a connect between healthcare and life sciences where discussion needs to happen. Yeah. And uh, in the industry of life sciences on the development side, the last years or so, uh, last five years, there is something called Allotrope, Allotrope Foundation that has come up. And uh, I had hoped that they would start data standards discussion and data standards exchange discussion. It hasn't evolved yet to, I believe, where it should be, but uh, this problem is not going to be solved today. Yeah. I'm just saying is there has to be a lot of discussion and a lot of disciplines have to come to the table to yeah. address it. Well, that's that's very true. It's good to know what we can pick up from other disciplines as well. I wanted to comment briefly on on your point that um, HEDIS and I think to some extent meaningful use are are some of the few levers that a whole institution will you know pay attention to and will likely to have some kind of an effect. I think if you have a quality rating that affects a whole institution or yeah. there's some bottom line financially, then you can get them to say you know this denominator isn't right because you're collecting it incorrectly and people will listen. I think beyond that, you know, most healthcare delivery organizations have too much going on to pay much heed to a research organization that says, you know, this, the quality of this data is very important and they'll, they'll yet nod, but there's, you know, 800 things above you on the thing. And that's just, just the way the real world is. But I think those are very important institutional levers that uh, we should try and employ. So the uh, organizations that can use them, there's somebody in the back, Siegfried, that's okay. Um, we, we should uh, collaborate in, in applying pressure to help people collect data in a, in a more complete way. So, um, so a couple of things. One, um, since we're running out of time, one, one thing related to data quality, and one thing when I came into this world, like uh, all these rules, and specifically the um, plausibility rules, are actually encoding knowledge. In bio, in biomedical informatics, we been uh, we have a long tradition of encoding knowledge in ontologies. So, so there is a lot of things that are encoded there. Like, uh, is this range plausible? Um, uh, will a man will undergo um, a mammography, like all, all of that is actually medical knowledge encoded in SQL queries. So, um, and, and I get what you were saying, like um, doing semantic checks because that is sort of the holy grail. Like yeah. you read Uber, like the, the super platform that Uber is building and they are doing, you know, we are doing all of this, but we yet need to do semantic checks. Again, semantics is related with knowledge, so what would be a frontier for us? Like, are we attempt to encode medical knowledge in the, because knowing if a creatinine value has sense, that's medical knowledge. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's the thing. So are we, are we going to try to go one step up and trying to encode this in something that are not SQL code? That's sort of the first uh, question. The second is relating the validation. Um, and this is just an open question. We may not have time to discuss just to, to quick it, given a, uh, a particular um, time where your CDM was checked and some variables were checked, that CDM could be served at the source of the validation set at some point if for a number of records was manually curated by somehow just throwing it around. So. Yeah, I think you bring up some really, really good points, especially the first one in terms of encoding that kind of knowledge um, as we develop what we are thinking about um, semantic data quality. And, and even that in itself, that encoding of knowledge is, is a discipline, I think, in itself to, to try and systematically be able to think through um, and, and how that works. That's a really, really um, good point. And interdisciplinary, because there's no way that an informaticist trying to, who's like a data custodian of a large data network, would have that deep of, a, of clinical knowledge. So, for, for those who aren't completely clear on, on what is meant by uh, a semantic data check and an approach, uh, yeah. what, what, how would you how would you describe? What yeah, so, so and and I'll we'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, 
that's kind of a term that, that we've been floating around. Um, the, the way that we would describe what a semantic data quality check is, so a lot of what we um, see in terms of data quality is, is these structural checks, um, these uh, do, do your labs fall within the normal range specified by the hospital that you are in or, or something like that. And a semantic data quality check that we are kind of in the process of thinking through is um, does it actually have meaning that makes sense? Not just does it fall within the structural constraints of, of what you, the, the check that you're developing, but within these contexts, within kids who have chronic kidney disease, is there urine protein what we would expect? You know, something, some, things like that. And that can get very tricky because there's millions of contexts that you can think of. And, um, but I think as, you know, as a network, what we are experiencing is that no matter how good some of our checks are, when we give out these data, these study specific, you know, data sets, or when people come and say, I want to know the feasibility of looking at X and Y, um, if that doesn't deliver, they'll, they'll walk away with, oh, they, they, their data is a mess. And because it's, it's, it's hard to, to do that. So um, trying to think of how to encode or how to, to think through study specific or context specific checks is kind of the term that we're using for semantic data quality. And again, this is kind of very, very new and things that we're just thinking about now. <laughs> so do you have further thoughts on that? I mean, it seems like I, 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 I'm tempted to boil it down, the, the idea of contexts into more complex relations amongst concepts that you would see in an OMOP CDM. So a, a version of verification that isn't simply that we know that a, a testicular cancer occurs in males, but something that is more richly informed by all the other pieces of data that you're, you're assessing the quality of. That's that's the gist of that idea. Is that a, a, a rough translation? It, of, it's of a bit, it but it, it sometimes can go even deeper than that um, in terms of thinking through, like, you know, like, for example, in, in the CON framework, when you think about the validation of, I think there was a temporal um, validation, the um, HbA1c values are the same as national references, for example, especially in, within groups, specific cohorts of interest. It's even thinking beyond uh, just what is these broad things that we would just kind of make sense to actual, you know, context specific. And I totally agree with you that as we do this, we need to think of some way to systematically encode these uh, kinds of things as well. Well, we've got a lot of smart folks in the room, including yeah. Rima. <laughs> Uh, who I know has thought a lot about these sort of things. So let's con let's continue this conversation. I would like to comment very quickly. I um, agree with Jose that uh, we have a great semantic platform in OMAP to be able to connect terms with rules. And uh, there are also systematic efforts like Michael Kahn's effort or the effort at Mini Sentinel to collect uh, very well known rules which, yeah. uh, which are connected to those to, to the concepts, to the semantic terms, and they may be encoded in SQL or SAS, it doesn't matter, but they are very well defined. So it's, it's another, I think, effort uh, for the community to think how to for, formalize connection yeah. between the vocabulary. Um, and once it's done once, it can, it, it's, interoperable, yep. it can travel wherever it needs to travel, and the rules. And also there are efforts which um, I think emerge and phenotype KB to actually um, translate rules into a code. So that's the next step. But at least if we have an explicit formalized connection between the rules, and I believe there is also work by Stephen Johnson uh, of ontology of data quality rules. Yeah. So we could reuse that. Yeah, I think I um, put a part of that up there. Yeah. And, and I think getting back to what the data quality framework is for, again, if you've got a sort of a complete uh, description of the space, you can you can divide it up into concepts that will have global unique identifiers, and and then I guess for each 
unit of semantic meaning, you can have an appropriate check that's got yeah. you know some sort of uh, stable and and very clear referent that that allows you to really understand what completeness means within a domain or, or for a particular concept. Did okay. you want to add anything, Jose, since you brought it up? No. Well, does anybody have thoughts on how to push that forward? Because that seems like a, you know a really interesting and important thing. Now, obviously, PedsNet is is doing that. Yeah, there, we're uh, we're it, trying to. Um, convince other people to fund us to do this work. So right. um, we we see a need for it, and we're trying to um, you know think because you know we've through experience have no matter how good some of our data quality checks are, they um, within certain study contexts it um, we always kind of run into problems. So uh, we're 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 trying to develop ways, and it would be great you know collaboration if people have ideas. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm 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 just joking. We actually like in terms of like submitting grants and things to um to fund like to kind of formalize and and like a like a scientific approach um to to do this. Yeah. When the industry funds things, uh, at least you can get uh, uh, at least the volunteers across the network to work yeah. together, but uh, you get some basic sponsorship. Yeah. And in, in the allotrope, for example, uh, the ontologies is, is, is a major thing that's going on right now. It's actually considered the biggest thing, and it's sort of the metadata yeah. that needs to be in place because you can have your data structure and all of that, but yes. uh, you, uh, you, the oh, industry I, has to work on the ontologies there. So I, I only see parallels. <laughs> no, I, I agree. And and I think, you know, as we do more of this kind of research, because I, I still think people are, you know, this is still kind of a new and budding field. Um, as we do more work in this, it's going to become a need um, to, to do this. Um, I, I wanted to get back to Tom's question about, uh, you know, what happens when you discover uh, one of these data quality problems. So we've got these great frameworks to, um, ontologies to classify data quality checks, and maybe we need some ontology to classify um, data quality problems. Um, so there's gonna be the ones that come in through the ETL process, and those obviously are gonna, you know, pr the people who are running the data quality checks may also be, you know, down the hall from the people running the ETL process, so they can just go and tell those people to fix it. Yeah. but you know, if it is like nobody's capturing this, yeah. then, you know, then you have to change your whole data collection system. There are also going to be data quality problems that are not even because of the collection, but are somehow, you know, systemic. Yeah. And then there's going to be data quality problems where we found that there's a data quality problem, but we don't really care because we don't collect that kind of data. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, I don't know, maybe um, maybe uh, I could collaborate on the paper with whoever wants to do that. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would be great. I, I, I do see a definite use case for that because how, how do you know what issues you're ha like, how do you know which checks to apply if there's no standard or formalized way to even communicate about what you're seeing? Yeah. I have a different problem there with some of my customers. Some of the customers saying, we want you to indicate that there is uh, issues with data somewhere, but we want that data available to us. Because if there is uh, data too clean, they don't trust the data. They expect that there is going to be pregnant male. They expect that it's going to be uh, GFR or uh, HPA1C, their values outside of the range there. So when the data is completely sanitized, I would say they're saying, we don't want that. We want to do our own validation there that there is certain percentage of providers will enter garbage. And if we'll have this data available to us, we will make our own decision. Yeah. Well, I, I think there there's always going to be noise um, if you are honest about, like, you know, identifying the data quality problems doesn't mean that something like, Sometimes it is a programming error, but sometimes it's the source system 
is wrong. And we, it's not up to us to really change what the source system says. I think it's up to us to kind of characterize what's going on and fix what we can and, and be able to communicate where there are just issues with the source system. So I don't, I don't think it's, we're, I, I don't, at least in our network, I don't see us ever becoming in danger of having too perfect of data. <laughs> And I think some people uh, find information in the amount of error that's coming from places. So if you've got multiple institutions that are submitting things and one of them consistently has lots and lots and lots of data missing where it shouldn't be and, and ranges that are out of check, it gives you a sense of how much weight you should put on, on that uh, institution. So if it were all cleaned up and hidden, you wouldn't have that information. And, and I, that's at least one rationale I've heard for, for wanting to, in addition to just a you know, an emphasis on transparency and being able to do things in a, in a thoughtful way, there's, a, there's actually information there in, in the amount of, of error from each source. It might be an interesting, um, um, doctors and hospitals tend to be pretty competitive. Yeah. And if you had the ability to be transparent about what the data quality was yeah. uh, f from those different groups and publish it, that might help uh, further drive the improvement, yes. but again, if you were the CEO and you saw that there were issues, you'd want to know where to focus because you, yeah. can't, you can't do it all. Yeah, and and I think getting some feedback from the community of what are some of those key variables or concepts that are either used across a large number of studies or are highly impactful yeah. at where there are quality issues yeah. that could then be used to then help prioritize where cleanup efforts might happen. Yeah. And it's funny. So another thing that I do where I, so my boss, um, is also an oncologist and, um, I, uh, have helped him with, uh, the, the U S news and world report, like ranking of, you know, divisions and, and that's another driver. And what I realized was that there's no standard with which these doctors, like how the data is being pulled institution by institution. I feel like it's almost, you can take that data and throw it like right out in the garbage because you know if we don't have at least a standard platform of, of how we're defining what this is um, it, it becomes useless and we know that hospitals are invested in these rankings and I feel like if we can like leverage those and push for some sort of you know baseline framework of how we're defining some of these things it, it'll be a lot more credible but it just we haven't gotten there yet um, so <sighs> Thank you. This is great discussion, actually. This is not a workshop. So uh, I have a, well, I want to extend that discussion to fit for purpose question that we get always for RWE research. So it, it may include um, data quality check. It may include some other aspect about the cohort that you are studying. Uh, is there any effort outside or inside of the community on fit for purpose? And, what it means and how we can figure out. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I don't think I got the last part of your Is question. Is there an effort either within Odyssey or elsewhere to uh, further specify what fit for purpose in the context of data quality actually means? Is that a good paraphrase on it? I mean, I you know, as as Andrew mentioned, Nicole Weisskopf's group, I think, is the data the the data quality collaborative. Um, I know within Odyssey, there's um, a lot of you know the data quality dashboard. There's Themis. There's different approaches that people can use, um, and within networks uh, that that use these data, you know, like I can say within PeedsNet, we are we are very much interested in in kind of uh, contributing and, and developing this this specific context, specific fit for purpose data. Um, so there are, there are groups out there um, within Odyssey and, and, you know, even like in the PCORnet world, I know, for example, they, they, they're doing a lot of this as well because a lot of their early demonstration projects um, demonstrated <laughs> that data quality was a problem. So, um, yeah, I think part of it also is convincing health services researchers that this is important because um, I think a lot of people who are in informatics or who work with data directly understand this. And I think it, to, to kind of under, communicate the importance of this kind of thinking is important um, as well. Yeah. And the uh, FDA's real world evidence program um, is developing guidance. And as a part of that, they've uh, they're holding meetings I've been a part of at uh, Duke Margolis Center to try and understand it's that 
central question, what, what is meant by fit for use in, oh, right. in that particular context is um, all the different networks that we've been mentioning, many different uh, data aggregators, lots of industry folks are all there and weighing in on how to understand that question, how to make it more specific, and where it should fit in the whole process of saying, here's yeah. evidence from a particular source, and how do we know whether it's regulatory grade, whatever whatever is meant by that. So there's a there's an ongoing effort that should produce a, a fairly clear document at the end of the day. It's it's yeah, in, it's in evolution. That, in evolution, did you want to? Yeah, exactly. That uh, the Duke Margolis uh, paper, uh, that was uh, the uh, thing that I wanted to refer to, and they they mentioned fit for purpose for RWE and FDA also put out a paper on it, but they didn't specify what it means and how you should measure it. And it, uh, I think it is an uh, open question, uh, at least in the domain. I don't know how uh, FDA has gotten involved in this area in terms of setting the uh, <laughs> uh, some measures or framework specifically for fit for purpose. Uh, I don't have any uh, uh, right now information about that, but if you can share that would be perfect. Well, that's what I meant that it's in evolution. So they, they published a guideline. They, they have a process for, you know, convening folks who are weighing in on this question. I think the, the final version of the guidance is something that should specify that. So there's, um, you're correct in that there isn't anything that's very specific about it now, but it is one of their goals. And so they're continuing to convene these panels to, to try and come up with something that is better specified. So I guess it's a wait and see kind of a thing, but it's, um, it's a lively set of conversations uh, about that that's, that's got an appropriate set of stakeholders. And uh, even though it's specific to this question of regulatory evidence, it's going to have broad applicability to any kind of data quality issue. So I think somebody else was raising their, their hand. Something I think a lot about in terms of fit for purpose is like fit for research purpose is very different than fit for clinical practice purpose. Yeah. So the way a doctor interacts with their EHR they're just trying to treat their patients and communicate with their patients. And I don't know if anybody read this New Yorker article last year, Death by a Thousand Clicks. Yeah. I think it was about Epic. And yeah. Epic's trying to collect the best data so we can do research. But now doctors are spending, you know, six hours a day in their EHR. So I just think it's a really interesting balance. And there's some onus, I think, on the EHR companies to design workflows that could, you know, funnel into all purposes that the data uh, might have. Yeah. That's very true. Um, I think on this, so fit for purpose sort of uh, gives us a way of thinking about that competitiveness, um, you know, and, and the, the use of data quality to get people to change practices. But I think, you know, what happens when you have people competitive and you have data quality out there that might get people to change practices is, you know, the CEOs are just going to say, well, yeah, let's not get our data out there because we don't want this. Um, with fit for use, I mean, we at least get to that question, like what, it, you know, how good does it have to be? And maybe with a lot of these data quality checks, the, the use is getting reimbursed by CMS. So is it good enough to, you know, to pass our clinical quality measures? Um, but I just was on a call for a new data quality tool that Jeff Brown had some big grant to put together. And, um, their tool very explicitly is not going to say good or bad. Yeah. Like they're not going to set any mark, any thresholds for you. And I think, you know, that it's because they want to address this point. They, yeah. they or they want to not address this point and not make people scared to put in their data quality. Right, right. It's interesting. Picornet has always used the word data characterization for what we call data quality. Um, and I thought that I think that's an interesting um, difference in term that that can mean something that you're more characterizing what your data look like rather than trying to say good, bad um, and that sort of thing. That's that's a good point. <laughs> So I, I can speak a little bit about uh, what it's like in lots of organizations, the size of the lift of actually trying to apply the kind of pressure you're talking about to get people to clean things up at the source. And it's just, uh, it's something that isn't, I think, very easy to appreciate unless you've been embedded in a situation. So I've, I've been a part of projects where very high ranking people within a large medical center are really 
hell bent on getting the right data that they need for a particular project that requires data quality to be high. And after years of effort and lots of lobbying, get nowhere, exactly nowhere. And it's because, you know, the thousands of people are involved, enormous IT investments are involved, whole structures about how care is delivered and who's able to do what are involved. And there are very few things that reach that threshold of importance that you're allowed to reorganize care and, and mandate that IT be shifted in the particular ways and so on and so forth. That all of that, all of what's really required to regularize and systematize how data is collected and how it's represented once it is collected is just, um, it's the Cadillac version of something. If, you're, if your company's survival financially is on the line, you're going to do it. There aren't a lot of things that, you know, below that level that really motivate it. And so I, I don't want to discourage efforts to kind of, you know, formulate plans for how to do that. Meredith Zosis has a student who's been uh, collecting and developing surveys on how to feed back to data stewards locally at organizations and get them uh, understand their incentives and feed them back the kind of information they would find useful. And I think that's all to be encouraged. It's really important yeah. work. But I think the size of the lift shouldn't be underappreciated. And the kind of, uh, you know, the idea of some world in which people kind of finally get the importance of this and, and are able to act on it is maybe not around the corner, I guess. So yeah. I, and going back to your point, I think where there's um, money on the line, <laughs> it, it motivates change pretty quickly. But I still think even when there's even when there's money on the line, even, for example, for the U.S. News and World Reporting, there's there's a lack of understanding of um, the nuance of why it's important to be able to standardize or um, to to um, make sure that Hospital A, their understanding of concept, whatever, is the same thing as Hospital B. And until you have that, you're, it's not really a fair comparison. I think that's where we as like data people need to make strong cases <laughs> for this sort of thing. I doubt we've got the answer to this, but one thing that I wonder about is um, as you develop a whole suite of data quality profiling that you want to do on the uh, CDM, what is the relative cost and effort of basically mapping your source data to CDM and taking advantage of all of those data quality checks and the ability to get that feedback versus custom building the same quality checks into your source systems up front? Um, and that there might be some interesting business opportunities there from vendors to say that, you know, here you've got the suite of um, researchers who've really figured out the right way to look at it and what's important. You know, if you um, sort of make an investment or, or allow a partnership to map it over to CDM, you get these quality checks for free yeah. in an ongoing fashion, as long as there's then also a commitment to make those data available for some of the research studies. Yeah. So I, th I think there's some, I, I hear the financial pressures, but I think there's some interesting win-win opportunities that can be put into that, whether it's from that perspective or, I mean, there are other organizations that are looking at value-based payment programs or other ways to incentivize to improve quality of the coding that can be tapped into. Yeah, prevent the quality problem before it happens. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's an area where these kinds of conversations, uh, the, the more that data quality becomes an issue in a broader community, the there will be a, a sense in which there's a market advantage for a vendor who wants to say this is a feature that you yeah. get from working with us, that we will you know, not only get the main functions done of billing and scheduling and, and getting this care delivered in the particular way it is or whatever it is, that uh, there's also this enormous data quality benefit because we've got this unique strategy that uh, is better than our competitors, that that isn't yet, I would say, something I've ever seen people really talk much about it in another than hand-waving kind of a way. There is a, an effort in device making to essentially do stuff that's going to enhance the, the value of data coming out of devices. There's going to be global unique identifiers for each device. There's going to be uh, metadata attachable to those that's going to help you understand the, the measurement capacities and other, you know, the sort of the ranges of, of uh, accuracy that you might expect and so forth that's going to be useful, not necessarily in the sense of data being missing or wrong or whatever, but just much more informative data about what's being measured amongst the things that, that are being collected, and that's on the horizon. Um, but this EHR level and other kinds of levels, I haven't seen that. It, would, it makes sense to me, and it would be great if we as a community can help you know, create demand for that in, in the marketplace, because I think that could be an important lever.
I never seen anybody pull the wallet for improving the data quality. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they are spending the money if they can uh, reduce inventory with this much, or if they can p deliver product on time to customer. Yeah. And and what has drawn me into this domain of RWE and Odyssey is the story that uh, Harlan, mm -hmm. the professor from Yale, was uh, was telling yesterday, and, and what the true value, what you can ultimately achieve. So I, I think uh, when you have a good message, you have to repeat that message a million times. <laughs> yeah. And that's the true value. And, and then, yeah, okay, you need to have the data quality to get there. Uh, but I, it's, uh, the value is, is elsewhere and it's not in the, in the data or in the data quality itself, but what you can get out of it. Yeah. Well, this has been an excellent conversation. Honey, was there anything else you wanted to cover? I don't think so. You did a great job. Thank you thank so you. much for that. Um, and thank you all. This was really very informative. So uh, we're ending about five minutes before uh, we'd plan to take our break. So we can I just give you that extra five minutes. So everybody come back in about 20 minutes. And we'll start to shift gears and get into the tools that you're all here to learn about how to use. So see you in 20 minutes.